So guys, what's going on? Uh, Kading, Greg Kading is out. His lawyer won't let him do it. So, so we've been waiting around for Kading all day, and yeah, and he now he's not coming. Really, I wanted to talk to him because there's so much to ask him. Yeah. Puffy was going upstairs, and he said, "I don't care if Tupac die, I don't care if Biggie gotta die, and I don't care if she gotta go to prison for the rest of his life." <laughs> Getting back to Russell, Russell was following in the footsteps of his dad, and he was able to work through the LAPD and have all the things that had to be done within the LAPD. He certainly knew the streets very well, and uh, his circumstances in his case were far more tragic because he was killed in the line of duty. Killed in the line of duty. If that's the case, did, Pac, did Tupac life mean anything? Because they never saw that case. Sometimes if you saw the first case, you might saw the second case. But that never happened, correct? Yep. But he did testify reluctantly. The death row records security chief Reggie Wright Jr. once told him, quote, we're going to get those mothers who downed Pac. Ice and I, we've heard consistently, Suge, that you're the person behind the hit on Biggie. Well, they looked at y'all and told y'all to put ass live. A reportedly missing photograph and former police chief Bernard Park's daughter came up during testimony today in the wrongful death lawsuit filed against the city by murder rap star Biggie Small's mother. Uh, that to me was probably another motive for Chief Parks to want to squash a lot of the information. There was an effort to, to keep a lot of the information away from the public. This declaration from a jailhouse informant named Kenny Boagney links crooked LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of rap star Biggie Smalls. Okay. Right, you see, Suge was willing to say, I didn't know those two cops, but maybe Reggie knew them. Never met those dudes, they never worked for me. They knew Reggie right. They didn't know me. We always did say, those are Reggie people. <laughs> And Reggie was fast to say, I didn't know them either. I was just interested in why he would point the finger at Suge so quick. He wouldn't say it to you, but he definitely pointed it. We call that dry snitching. That Perez told how he worked security for Death Row Records the night Biggie Smalls was assassinated, and how he and Mac used cell phones to set up the hit. Boagney now says he was instructed by an LAPD detective to share his story with no one else investigating Biggie's murder. Judge Florence Marie Cooper says LAPD may be involved in what she calls deliberate and intentional concealment of information. Jailhouse informant Kenny Boagney ties former LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of rap star Biggie Smalls. LAPD has withheld reams of other evidence as well, including at least two other jailhouse statements implicating dirty cops Mac and Perez in Biggie's murder. A thousand pages of information were withheld describing Mac and Perez's involvement in Biggie's murder. Three different jailhouse informants who offered to wear a wire were all turned down by LAPD. A wire, say informants, that could have caught jailed officer Perez boasting about his involvement with death row records and the Biggie Smalls murder. Judge Florence Marie Cooper lists all the new information she says links former crooked LAPD officers David Mack and Rafael Perez to the murder of Biggie Smalls. The sheer volume of the information, says the judge, belies any LAPD argument that it comes from just another jailhouse informant. Murder is pretty simple. The first person you go after is the spouse. Perez and was all involved. They were trying to kill me too, but see, because Perez and, and, and Reggie was good friends, and Perez and Sarita and Reggie was great friends, and so all those three together was trying to plot. Those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac, watching it. So that just took the iceberg when something happened. But that was, there was a plan already to do something to him. Atlanta wasn't even the shooter, you know? He was actually a good kid, too, you know? I'm quite sure they, 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 they saw the first one, they saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. This is part five 
of the Russell Pool theory into the murders of Tupac and Biggie. And now you have a criminal probe that's going into death row records. You have this record label becoming extremely high profile, uh, front covers of magazines and video records. You've got murder trials and you've got uh, criminal defense and you've got record sales and you've got incendiary lyrics and you've got people interceding to try and shut down the record label and so you have this probe. You have Dan Quayle getting up and talking about how Tupac's lyrics have no place in society. And this really started back in the NWA days with the, uh, with the uh, NWA song that was done by Ice Cube. And so there is pressure put on law enforcement to do something about this record label. And there is a probe into drug trafficking and money laundering. And you have security at Death Row Records handling multiple layers. And so they are basically doing surveillance on the people that are doing surveillance on them. And they're feeding all of this information to David Kenner. And David Kenner is an extremely skilled criminal defense attorney who knows how to turn this system upon itself. In the case of the Kelly Jamerson beating at the El Rey Theater, you have no prosecution because it would have involved too many police officers. And police don't cross the thin blue line. And so none of these uh, incidents that happen at death row records can be prosecuted because police aren't going to collect the evidence against other police. Police aren't going to investigate other police. And they're going to provide courtesy. And whenever a badge is flashed by a cop with another cop, there's a courtesy that gets extended. And you have David Kenner turning this system on itself. If the prosecutions would happen and the civil suits would follow, there would be way too much money that would have to be paid out. And so this is creating a situation where the system has been turned on itself. And that's one thing that these guys are very skilled at doing. And that's because you have a criminal defense attorney who knows the game, planning and plotting how everything is going to happen. So this entire death row system is, uh, has become a well-oiled machine. They got publicity. They know whenever there's uh, headlines, how to capitalize on it. They know how to sell records. And so they've got publicity set up. They've got security set up. They've got a criminal defense set up. They have a well-oiled machine for the artists at Death Row Records. They have demos that are being mailed to them by people from all over the world. And Shug says when those demos came in, they would listen to them. They'd have somebody listen to them. When they heard something that was good, they would pass it on. They would perfect those lyrics. They would perfect those beats. And then they would release those songs. They had the fans all doing the major work for the record label. And that's how they would make the songs and the music. And that was all put into place well before Tupac Shakur joined the record label. Now, Tupac had history. He had history with Easy e Easy e was originally going to sign Tupac, and then the whole blowout happened with Ruthless Records. There was an incident that happened between Dre and Snoop on one side and Tupac and Easy e on the other side. And that's, that's a subject of another video. So clearly there's a lot of tension that's going on between Crips and Bloods and between the Tupac and the Snoop thing. Snoop takes credit for having gotten uh, Shug to sign Tupac. I'm not sure that that's true. And you can see that from the minute Tupac arrives at the label, Snoop is knee deep in his murder trial. Tupac signs with Death Row Records. There is a rift that happens with Snoop. And in fact, Snoop is trying to leave the record label in the middle of his murder trial. 
He's trying to set up something over at Warner's. He's got his little posse that he's trying to set up, the dog pound over there. There's a few artists that he's got, and he's recording using Death Row Records uh, resources to try and set up his own music and his own deal over at another label. And this is at the time Tupac is coming on to the record label. So I find it very doubtful that Snoop is the catalyst and the reason behind uh, Tupac coming to Death Row Records. And I think it has more to do with a woman that was working in publicity that started to reach out to Tupac and started to write him letters. And she was the one that gave Suge and David Kenner the number for Tupac. There is a, uh, a meeting that happens at Dannemora Prison. It's supposedly a jailhouse deal that gets signed on toilet paper or whatever, but that's not the case at all. This is a contract that got signed by Suge on the 15th, and it got signed by Tupac on the 16th of September, 1995. And that seals Tupac coming on to the record label. In October, Tupac is released. He immediately comes to Death Row Records, focused and ready to work. He goes right into the recording studio and lays down tracks. He's been sitting pent up in prison for quite some time, and he is very happy to be free, and he just wants to get down to business. He wants to get records done. He wants to get money. He wants to buy things for his mom and for other people he cares about. And he is very focused on working. And Snoop is in the middle of his murder trial. So in the middle of his murder trial, he definitely doesn't have the energy or the time to be recording. And so there's absolutely no fight over resources when Tupac originally shows up. But as Tupac and, uh, you know, continues to record, they do the California Love. That was a song meant for Dre. Dre wanted to keep that song, and Dre reluctantly hands it over to Tupac, and it becomes a seminal classic. Now, something happens at the California Love shoot. You have Kevin Gaines and Sharitha Knight, who had a much more, uh, you know, deepening of their relationship than the others, because Kevin Gaines becomes Sharitha Knight's boyfriend. And that causes problems with Suge. So Kevin Gaines will show up at things, and it does irritate Suge to know that his wife is now hanging out with a cop, a man with a badge and a gun, and who knows how to use it. And so at the California Love Shoot, uh, Sharitha and Kevin Gaines show up, uh, and this is uh, one of the legend stories of Death Row Records, and there's no reason to not think that it's true. It comes from pretty credible sources, and this is that Kevin Gaines and Sharitha are driven to a hole in the desert. They're stripped down naked where they both think they're about to be murdered, and they're left for dead in the middle of nowhere by Reggie Wright Jr. and Suge Knight. Now, because there was this deepening of the relationship between Kevin Gaines, Rafael Perez, uh, Reggie Wright Jr., Sharitha, Snoop, it probably uh, was the reason that they weren't killed then. Because what would have happened if they were seen driving off and then those guys never came back, those guys disappeared? There would have been retaliation from this group with Suge immediately. And so this is just a warning. This is just to scare them into knowing that Suge means business, and back they go. But can you imagine how upset a Kevin Gaines would be? An LAPD cop that was known not to be messed with has been stripped down naked at gunpoint by Reggie and Suge, and they are left for dead. Now, it's highly likely that Reggie Jr. sent a car to go collect them. But even if they were out in the middle of the desert for an hour or two hours, can you imagine how fuming mad they would be? And this is where we now see the catalyst is happening, where Suge and Tupac are putting themselves in the crosshairs of these cops that are thieves 
at the record label. Also, at Christmas time now, we have a Christmas party that happens. And Dre, Tupac, and Suge take Mark Anthony Bell upstairs and they beat and intimidate him and they make him drink urine and they do all those things to try and get Puffy's address, Puffy's telephone number. And this is because of the rift that had happened. Uh, Puffy and Biggie didn't reach out to Tupac when he was in prison. They didn't put money in his books. They didn't do things that uh, friends are supposed to do for other friends when they go to jail or when they go to prison. And so that upset Tupac. And who reached out to Tupac? The only ones really reaching out to Tupac were, was Death Row Records. And Interscope was doing everything they could to push Tupac onto Death Row Records. Tupac was owed a lot of money by Interscope. They clearly didn't want to pay Tupac. They could have written a check directly for his bail. They didn't do it. They pushed Tupac onto Death Row Records. And that's how the, uh, the thing even happens. And now you have the Mark Anthony Bell incident. And what is it that Suge tries to do with all of his artists? He tries to compromise them. He tries to get something on them. He wants to create leverage on his artists. And now the Mark Anthony Bella incident is leverage on Tupac. Uh, Kevin Gaines extremely pissed off at the California love shoot. And now you have uh, Snoop Dogg's murder trial coming to a close in February. And this is where we're going to pick up in the next installment. Murder is pretty simple. The first person you go after is the spouse. All the artists at Death Row was willing to come with him. David Mack worked for you, right? No, ma'am. Never? Never met him. Never heard of him. Didn't know who he was until the accusations that he possibly did work for me. And that's been investigated by LAPD and all of that. Why would I want a paper trail when I never brought him around nowhere? So if I'm going to hide him in secret, you think I'm going I'm to let somebody catch a paper trail? They were paying cash by Snoop. Perez and was all involved. They were trying to kill me too. But see, because Perez and, and, and Reg and his good friends, and Perez and Sarita and Reg and his great friends, and so all those three together was trying to plot. How about Rafael Perez? Never heard of him until all the incidents happened. Those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac, watching him. So that just took the iceberg when something happened. But that was, there was a plan already to do something to him. So why does everyone keep telling me that David Mack was working for you? Yeah, I never heard that. You never heard that? That he worked for me. I You've heard, never heard that? Wait a minute, let me clear that up. I'm saying by anyone that's credible, that will work around there or anything. Um, like I said, that was all investigated by LAPD. I turned over my payroll, everything. You always will tell you, those are Reggie people. <laughs> Atlanta wasn't even a shooter, you know? He was actually a good kid, too, you know? I'm quite sure they, 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 they saw the first one, they saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people. You got a lot to cover up, y'all. You got a lot to cover up. Same people, same circle of people. It had nothing to do with me, you know?